Hello and welcome to this video recapping on negligent misstatement. So we've seen a negligent misstatement is unspoken or written words made by a defendant which the claimant relies on and suffers loss, which is likely to be a loss of money. So unlike a negligent act which causes physical injury or damage to property, a negligent misstatement is much more likely to just involve losing money, which is a pure economic loss. And we saw in the video on pure economic loss that generally this cannot be claimed. And we saw that from the cases of Weller and Spartan Steel, that you can't claim for a simple pure economic loss. And the main reason is because it um, potentially opens the floodgates of litigation. And the other uh, policy reason is that courts want to encourage the use of contract between parties because then you can allocate the losses between parties and decide in advance of something happening who will bear a loss. But the exception to this is negligent misstatement. And we saw when we studied precedent that in Carla and Queen Christmas, uh, the Court of Appeal held that you couldn't claim for a negligent misstatement, but that Lord Denning made a dissenting judgment. And it was that dissenting judgment that was persuasive in the case of Hedley, Byrne and Heller, when the House of Lords overruled Carner and Crane Christmas and said you can claim for negligent misstatement where there is a special relationship. And special relationship just changes proximity. All the other elements of negligence remain the same. So this means that the first thing to consider when you're looking at a scenario about negligent misstatement is foreseeability. So some economic harm must be reasonably foreseeable to someone in the claimant's position as a result of the defendant's negligent misstatement. And when you're applying it, you need to say why you think that that is the case. And the authority is Kent and Griffiths in the normal way, or Hedley, Byrne and Heller can be used here. So then you need to move on to whether there is a special relationship. And this is where the test of proximity is altered and we are going to be looking for the special relationship. We're going to use the mnemonic, some people like loud rap, to help you remember the elements in order. And the first one, S, for some, is special skill. So the defendant has to have a special skill or expertise in relation to the statement. So they're likely, you're likely to have someone who is an expert in your scenario, but have they actually got a special skill in relation to the statement, in relation to what they are advising about? And in Esso and Marden, the uh, defendant did have a special skill in relation to estimating petrol sales. But in Mutual Life and Evert, the uh, person in that scenario did not have a special skill in relation to investment advice, which is what they were giving, as they were insurers. So you need to decide uh, whether they do have a special skill in relation to the statement. And uh, if you're not sure, then just try and have um, a go at thinking whether that sort of professional would have that sort of skill. Occasionally you see um, it said that they hold themselves out to have a special skill. If you have someone who is implying or acting as if they are an expert, for example, in the hospital, if they're wearing a white coat and a stethoscope, they, you may think they are holding themselves out to be a doctor. Um, so it's worth looking out for that. Um, the people, in some people like loud rap, stands for purpose. And so the second element is that the defendant must know or ought to know the purpose for which the advice is sought. And this comes from Kapara and Dickman. So what is there in the scenario that shows that the defendant knew why the claimant was asking for advice? The third element from like is likely. So you have to show that the defendant knows or ought to know that the claimant is highly likely, we always remember the word highly, it's important to say highly likely, to rely on the statement. And this comes from um, Smith and Bush. And this is the um, lovely diagram I drew to help you understand it. And in this case, um, we had our purchaser, Mr. Smith, and he wanted to buy this house, which was £300,000. Um, I made the, the sum up, but that's not exactly how much it was. He borrowed some money, which is called a mortgage, from a bank. But the bank needs to make sure they're going to get their money back. So they um, get a surveyor to check the value of the house. And in this case, it was Eric Bush, um, a firm of surveyors who checked the value. 
and they got it wrong and they seriously overvalued the house. And so Mr. Smith ended up with a house he paid a lot for, but which was not worth very much. However, he didn't have a contract with the surveyor. So he was unable to sue them for breach of contract. However, he sued them for negligent misstatement. And the court accepted this claim as they said that the surveyors, Eric Bush, should have known that Mr. Smith was highly likely to rely on the valuation they gave, as the statistics showed that uh, most purchasers relied on the bank surveyor and did not get their own survey. So because of that, they said that there was a special relationship. The fourth element, the for the L for loud, stands for loss. And you have to show that the claimant relies on the statement to their detriment and they suffer loss. And in JEB Fasteners and Bloom, they were not able to show this. The claimant couldn't show that they relied on the accounts that they had been shown um, because they were going to buy the company anyway. And the reason they were going to buy anyway was because they wanted two employment contracts of the two directors. So that's why they bought the company. So they hadn't relied at all on the um, statement, which in this case was a set of accounts. So you have to show that you um, that the claimant has relied, and usually you can show that if in the case of, um, say, a valuation, they will have gone ahead and bought something, so they have relied on the statement, and they've suffered loss because it turns out to not be worth as much as they thought it was going to be. And then the last element, RAP, stands for reasonable, and there are lots of marks available here um, for you showing that the claimant has been able to prove it was reasonable for him to rely on the defendant's advice. Whether it's reasonable depends on all the circumstances of the case. And I would recommend that each time you mention a factor, you say, so this makes it reasonable to rely. Or so this means it is not reasonable to rely each time. Don't just list the factors. And you're going to try and use two to three. Um, so of this, these, this additional um, mnemonic, WWWQI. So the first W is who said what and you've probably already established that you've got an expert so it might be reasonable to rely because an expert has given uh, the advice. Note that what we're not looking for here is whether the advice was reasonable that is not the question it's whether it's reasonable for the claimant to rely on the advice given in this situation. You can also consider or whether it's reasonable to rely on advice that's been given directly to you. It's much more likely if the advice has been given, given directly to from the defendant to the claimant, then it's going to be reasonable to rely. And this was confirmed in the case of Goodwill and BPAS, um, the case about the man having a vasectomy, where a later girlfriend tried to rely on advice given to him about the effectiveness of the vasectomy when she became pregnant. Um, it might have been a different story had he been claiming, we'll never know, but they said there couldn't be liability to a later um, class of people because it could have included any number of people and would have opened the floodgates of litigation. The advice had not been given directly to her and it was not reasonable for her to rely on it. Uh, the next W you can think about is social situations. Um, in Headley Byrne, they said giving advice in a social situation would probably not give rise to liability, but later cases have cast doubt on this. So in Chowdhury and Prabhaka, St Burgess and Lejo Vaughan, advice given by a friend in a social situation and without charge did give rise to potential liability. Chowdhury and Prabhaka was about a friend advising on buying a car and Burgess and Lejo Vaughan was about um, advising on a um, garden makeover. And in uh, both of those cases, um, they said there was liability in a social situation. And in exam, you often get things about parties or friends or social situations. And so you need to point out that it may be reasonable to rely based on these authorities. Uh, then you could, the third W um, could be what and the level of detailed details. So if the advice is very detailed or um, it's in writing or there's a very large sum of money involved, it might be uh, reasonable to rely. The Q stands for qualification. If the person giving the um, statement didn't qualify their advice in any way, then it might be reasonable to rely on it, Henderson and Merritt. This doesn't mean that you are qualified to give the advice. It's not about your qualifications. 
qualifying it is something like saying, oh, I better check this or oh, I haven't done this for a long time or you better ask somebody else. If the person's just gone right ahead and given the advice without any qualification, then it might be reasonable to rely. And the lastly, the I stands for independent advice. And in a situation where um, the advice giver might have expected the claimant to get another opinion, a second opinion, independent advice of some sort, it might not be reasonable for the claimant to rely on what the defendant has said. And the cases of James Manorton and Hicks and Patchett and Sparta are both about this in both cases. They said in this instance, you would have expected someone involved in this type of transaction to have actually gone and got a second opinion. The um, Patchett and Sparta was about a recommendation for a contractor to build a swimming pool on the internet. And they, the court said you would have expected someone to have gone and got a separate um, reference or something else to recommend the contractor, not just gone straight ahead on the basis of one thing on, online. And then at the end, you need to conclude. So once you've decided all these factors, conclude overall whether you think there is a duty. Even if you don't think there is a duty, you need to carry on. But you need to say on the basis that there's a duty, you're going to carry on and you're going to do your normal A, B, C, D of negligence. So you will go on to breach and set your standard. The defendant has to reach the standard of a reasonable whatever it is, builder, auctioneer, surveyor, usually a professional, so Bollum will be relevant. Then risk factors. If you have time, do all of them. If you don't, just do likelihood and seriousness. Uh, exactly the same case authorities. Uh, financial loss is likely and could be serious if you give poor financial advice, for example, and change it according to your scenario, as um, you might lose money. So more care was needed. If you've got time, do cost and practicality and social benefit. Then balance up the risk factors and conclude whether there's a breach. Then go on to causation. Uh, in the same way as in the ordinary tort of negligence, you use the but for test for factual causation, Barnett and Chelsea, and identify the type of harm here, the economic loss, and whether it's reasonably foreseeable and not too remote, in which case there will be legal causation. The usual defence, if there is one, um, would be contribution negligence. If the claimant has contributed to the financial loss that they've suffered and would have their claim reduced accordingly, maybe using Sayer and Harlow as an authority. And the remedy is damages. And as we've already seen, this would be special damages, which is pure economic loss in this case, um, but would be recoverable under the Headley Byrne principles that we've discussed, saying that there is a special relationship. So once you've had a chance to um, review negligent misstatement, you'll need to practice some scenario questions. This could come up um, as a multiple choice question, five, ten marks or longer questions like this one, uh, which is from one of the past papers. And in this question, uh, once you've had a time to look at it, you'll see that there are three separate parts. The first paragraph is about um, negligence. The second paragraph is about negligent misstatement. You can tell that because they've lost out economically, they've lost money, whereas in the first paragraph, someone has suffered a broken leg. And the third part is the last part of the question, assessing how a court decides that a duty of care is owed. And this relates to the theory of tort law, which we haven't done yet, so you don't need to worry about that. The marks for this type of question divide up into 23 marks for the negligence and the negligent misstatement and seven marks for assessing how the duty of care is owed. And that might also be an English legal system question there instead for seven marks. So overall, for a scenario like this, I'd recommend you spend about 40 minutes, of which probably roughly 15 minutes is going to be negligent misstatement. So that's the sort of time frame you're aiming for. So I hope that's been useful. Thanks very much.